Thank you everyone uh, for joining us today. Um, this is our fourth in the spring webinar series. Um, I'm Miles, I'm the Outreach and Communications Manager for the Department of um, Agriculture, Environmental Development Economics. Um, and to just start us off um, with a few housekeeping pieces, um, all of you will be muted. Um, throughout the webinar, um, and uh, you're welcome to place your questions in the chat. Um, and yeah, I think that's kind of about everything. Uh, let me know, Brent, if I messed anything up on that, but I will go ahead and send it over to uh, Brent, who will be uh, introducing our um, speaker today. So thank you. Great, thanks a lot, Miles, uh, and welcome everybody to the webinar uh, in our webinar series for the department. Really appreciate your attendance and really appreciate uh, Mark Partridge for joining us today to talk about a uh, really interesting topic about solar energy and achieving that zero and its impacts on rural Ohio. Uh, so without, I don't wanna spend a lot of time, but I do wanna introduce Mark as our C. William Swank Chair of Rural Urban Policy at Ohio State University. Uh, those of you who know Mark know him as a, uh, strong economist with a lot of sort of public policy insights uh, and a lot of insights that have helped us in Ohio sort of better understand and manage the development within the state. So without much more introduction, Mark, I'm happy to turn it over to you and appreciate your joining us today. Do put folks uh, any questions you'd have for Mark in the chat or the Q&A feature. We'll keep track of those and ask them to Mark uh, at the end of his presentation. So thanks, Mark. Thanks, Brent. Uh, Miles, uh... So I take it I'm screen sharing now, is that correct, Brent? Yep, looking good. Okay. So what I'm gonna talk about today could have a, a couple other possible titles. Uh, of course, I found out it's it's a National Crawfish Day, which is a, I, I guess I should have already known that, so that I could entitle it this, but uh, one of the things I'm gonna, they'll be talking about is it's not so much the feasibility, uh, technical feasibility, but is the uh, what's being asked of rural areas in terms of, uh, achieving net zero or a, an economy where we're putting out uh, on on balance no net carbon emissions that if we, if we if we produce carbon emissions we store it somehow or what have you or use renewables instead don't not producing carbon uh, so it's going to put a lot of costs on rural America uh, especially here in the Midwest and so my view is is that is this politically feasible and uh, uh, the, and I'll be raising the possibility that it's not politically feasible, current plans, and that rural America is going to have to be asked to be, uh, uh, is going to have to, well, not going to have to, we'll probably be asking a lot in return for this to go fully forward towards 2015 or 2050. So another uh, alternative is, is where's my food going to be grown from? Uh, uh, I'll get to that here in a little bit. So as I just said, we're going to have some rather dramatic effects on land use. Uh, and in this is whether uh, whether we want to or not, we're, at the moment, we're being drug into a massive change in our energy production towards renewables, uh, large subsidies. I'll talk about some of that uh, in a little bit. Uh, in certain states, some of our neighbors, uh, whether it's a red state like Indiana, a blue state like Illinois, they've embraced this uh, clean energy economy. In, in the case of Indiana, they have reported, at least it's been reported in the newspapers and other media that their economic development strategy is really uh, putting clean energy at the, at the forefront because they say that their uh, uh, development site selection people keep hearing, oh, uh, from firms, we want, we want to have clean energy. That's an important part. And I don't know if that's from a firm's perspective that they're greenwashing for customers or that uh, they want to get ahead of the curve and they don't want to be some sort of last minute struggle while other places are trying to catch up. But that's what they're saying. So Indiana's embraced it. On the other hand, Ohio's been more reluctant to move towards uh, uh, clean energy. And I'll talk a little bit about that as well. And in fact, I'll just note it right now that going back to 2011, Robert Bryce, who tracks these, and if you get a hold of my slides, which we'll make available, uh, I, I, I put little links where you can get all the underlying source information. Robert Bryce, who keeps tabs on this, notes that between 2011 and the summer of 2023, 583 wind or solar projects were rejected by, for land, by land use planning, by local land use reasons. 140 of those were in Ohio, almost one fourth of the entire country. We're just here in Ohio. 
uh, even though we're about 3% of the U.S. population. And at least 10 counties and 40 townships ban uh, solar farms, for example. So this compares by, I, I just mentioned Indiana and Illinois, this compares to 21 or, and 22 rejections in their case. And then in the case of solar, it's really placing, you're out in rural areas, increasing land demands. And how sustainable is that for rural areas to maintain? Also, I'll talk about that we're talking about enough land, especially given it's in productive regions of the US in terms of agriculture, that we could be talking about uh, uh, effects on food supplies. We get to the middle of the century. And that would also certainly raise concerns with everybody, regardless of where you live. And so if you take an example, Pulaski County, Indiana, which is uh, in between Indianapolis and Chicago, it's a ground zero for this. Right, right now, they've been fighting, internally fighting uh, with a, a, a industrial sized uh, wind farm. Uh, that's about the size of the island of Manhattan, plus other developments there. They're putting on a lot of uh, uh, you know, a lot of strife that you would see in rural areas. It's, some people want this, some people really don't want this, and really dividing rural communities. And the other feature, you know, sticking with Indiana is kind of a counterexample to Ohio, is that they also have large industrial parks that they've been putting in. I mean, I mean, on a large scale, like one in Boone County that's not too far from Indianapolis. Uh, has uh, 9,000 acres funded by the Indiana Development Corporation. And this was prime farmland, which raised concerns. And likewise, it's because it's, I think, for pharmaceuticals, there's a large water demands. They're currently, they're planning on pumping 10 to 20 million gallons of water a day for industrial uses in that, in that industrial park and up to 100 million in the future. And so, you know, all sorts of land use pressures are happening in Indiana like elsewhere, just beyond when we're talking about uh, uh, alternative or renewable energies. So in Indiana's case, they've uh, been somewhat proactive. Uh, they formed their legislature last year, passed a bill signed by the governor to have a statewide land use committee. And I put this parts of the law down there in section six, which indicate that uh, such as economic, you know, they're trying to look at economic development factors associated with land use, uh, how rural, urban, and suburban communities are differentially affected by land use policy, where, again, a key driver of that is these uh, solar, you know, large-scale solar projects, which are causing a lot of division in, in uh, rural communities. So the U.S. is not alone in terms of having opposition to solar farms. Uh, the Guardian newspaper reports a lot on climate change. And they've reported a lot in the last, say, three, four years about global opposition to be near uh, large industrial scale, scale solar parks. So, you know, even in Europe, where you would think that there'd be less opposition to such uh, developments, you see large opposition. You see large opposition in Australia. You see large opposition in places like California, where you, again, might think there'd be less opposition to it. And so it isn't just an Ohio phenomenon. It is, it is a global phenomenon that people are unhappy. They don't want to be near solar development. Uh, you know, I, I think that would be on an individual basis why you don't want to be located by it. Is it, you know, how much of it does it ruin the view uh, versus how much you might be a farmer and it's going to take away farmland that you used to rent or split up how you do your farming. I mean, it could be for a lot of variety of reasons that somebody could be opposed to that. But it's been very divisive, a lot of uh, opposition in many places. So even though I'm not going to talk about it, you know, one would ask, you know, maybe Ohio should be at the forefront of this, given the kind of scale that's going to be necessary, especially in terms of solar, if we're going to reach net zero. So you know, how much state uh, regulation would we want? And, it, you know, in, in the sense that... Uh, uh, if we leave it up to the local areas, which has a lot of advantages within the local views are expressed, but then if uh, if in the local areas some communities, you know, don't do any, and some communities do a lot, we could just have this checkerboard of differential regulations going on. So all of these, you know, land use issues, you know, bringing up all these hosts of thinking, you know, what what should we be doing, weighing economic development and environmental concerns. And also in a way that there's trade-offs and not everybody's going to be happy with the, with the final solutions. So I'm going to be talking about a report 
that came out from out of Princeton as a benchmark study uh, 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 that's received a lot of attention in Washington. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk about, not necessarily that it's the law, but it's been very influential in terms of Biden administration policy, in terms of at least uh, early efforts to reach net zero. And even in this report, which was trying to say, hey, these are, we technically can get to net zero. It's, it's to engineer, it, the engineering is there, we can do it by the middle of the century. Uh, it didn't talk about the various kinds of costs, or at least in a very detailed way. And I just noted, I, I note down here at the bottom of this slide, up to 49 million hectares of land will be converted to uh, ag agricultural land will be converted to conservation uh, in this plan. And another nine to 34 million hectares will be converted to forest land as carbon sinks. So if you figure that the US has around 400 million hectares, we're already, you know, we're talking about a lot of land. We're talking about a lot of agricultural land. Now, and, you know, at first one would hope, and as an economist, I would hope, well, the first land you would use is the least productive land, which wouldn't have very much of an effect, you know, very marginal effects. But as I will go through, that's not necessarily the case of various idiosyncrasies of uh, the energy industry and various idiosyncrasies, in particular of our of our national electric grid. So just to give you a feeling for the kind of scale, you know, kind of jumping ahead, this is a this is from um, uh, from the federal government, the U.S. government. Uh, uh, and this shows 7.7 .7 million hectares of land in the lower 48 states. And you can see they show it like in the, in the size of states, you know, forest is 28%, crop lands 1.6 million kilometers, square kilometers, uh, that'd be about 640,000 square miles. Uh, that's about 21% of our land use and so on. Uh, urban's about 4% by comparison. And so just, just, and, and I'm going to say this is actually much smaller than the uh, uh, the carbon sink numbers I was just talking about. Uh, this is the kind of land use that they're talking about under various scenarios in reaching net zero. Like this E plus is a high energy, you know, high energy efficiency, but also moving uh, to an, the electric grid. In other words, say take the transportation system with, with electric vehicles, we get it out of uh, uh, out of fossil fuels, we plug it in. And so the electricity is coming from the electric grid. So the car itself or the uh, truck itself isn't producing any uh, CO2, but the, uh, uh, depending on how the electric, you know, if it's all renewables for the electricity, then it's all going to be renewables. So E plus would be assumed, hey, we're gonna really do that well. And there's already reasons why to believe that that's not going so well at the moment. You know, so this E, E plus RE plus is high efficiency, high renewable. So under that scenario, uh, wind farms will take up in their estimates to technologically achieve net zero, one million square uh, kilometers. And at the top of the slide, I note that the US has, or no, here, the US has 7.7 .7 million uh, square uh, uh, kilometers of land. In other words, that's almost one seventh. Now, to be fair, to be you know detailed, complete, the wind farms themselves, that is that's just the size where the wind farms will be, not necessarily the size of the structure of the wind farm. In other words, you can still do some agriculture, maybe not as efficiently, by going around the wind turbines and so forth. But it's not like a like solar, where almost a hundred percent of the land, at least right now, is is taken away from alternative uses if you go to solar. And then you see solar here is 0 0.061, 61,000 square kilometers. So right there, as it says, uh, uh, you're using about 1.1 square kilometers of our 7.7 .7 million square kilometers. That's a lot of land. And as I was saying, in terms of, because as I'll go through, a lot of that is here in the Midwest, and where you want to put, especially solar, generally because it's less expensive to build, in uh, uh, flat places. Well, that's pretty much farmland. That's going to have a lot of effect on cropland. You know, disproportionately good cropland in the Midwest. Disproportionately, solar is going to want to be in that kind of landscape because it's less easier or less costly to set up. So uh, we're, we're 
you know, and, and also given that the entire world would be presumably doing more renewable solar wind, uh, we're, we're, you know, we're now talking about quite a bit of land worldwide where one could see scenarios that, oh, well, maybe food prices would be affected. This isn't, you know, if it was, we're just talking about one state, it would be, well, you know, whatever, you know, in terms of the worldwide agricultural uh, market. But we're talking about the entire world doing this. And we're now talking about quite a bit of land. So uh, I won't go into great detail, but why is the rush, you know, well, why are we trying to build utility scale solar? Because if you build solar in a urban environment, usually rooftops, like you go to San Diego, I had a great view of all these solar in my hotel room when I was at a conference a couple of months ago, great view of all these solar facilities or solar panels on top of buildings, but it's about 250 to 350 per watt of capacity uh, uh, to build in an urban environment versus 77 cents to $1.36 for rural large scale solar farms. So you can see, it, you know, it's up to, uh, you know, one fourth, uh, less than up to only one fourth of the cost to go in rural areas. And uh, according to estimates, you can earn about a uh, farm $21,000, $42,000 an acre or a rate of return of about 10 to 20 percent on solar currently. And that's being propped up largely from uh, federal subsidies. Uh, I have, if you get a hold of my slides, I have how they're structured in there uh, from the Inflation Reduction Act signed in 2022, but they, they tend to be you know, on average around 40% of the capital costs if you meet the criteria, uh, like build in America and it's so forth. Uh, and you know, even even a even a professor can make money if your capital is being subsidized at a rate of forty percent. And generally, studies that have looked at what's the effect of being near a solar large scale solar farm. Now, these are you know the the amount of research that's been done on this is not large, but the early studies are that housing values are about one to four percent lower. Say when you're near one, say within five hundred meters of a of a solar project. So if we're talking about average home prices in rural areas of 200,000, in a sense, neighbors are paying 2,000, 1%, or up to $8,000 they're you know, paying because they have now have lower value home prices. Uh, and the other feature that's driving this, and, and it's why Ohio, we're you know, like looking out today, we're not, we're not particularly a sunny place. Why here? Well, uh, the big reason why, as I'll show you when I talk about the grid, is that the developer of the solar project has to build the trunk line, the uh, the spur line from the solar farm to the major transmission lines. And so you want to be near the major transmission lines when you build solar farms. And so that's why you see solar development taking place. If you look at Ohio, and then you overlay it, as I saw a presentation by one of our extension people, Eric Romich, he showed our transmission lines and where solar farms are going, and they just went, you know, right, they corresponded with one another. So why aren't these in eastern Montana, for example, which is sunny here? There's, you know, agriculture's, you know, it's not the most prime farmland. Uh, so, you know, to get, put that in perspective, first, with solar, because that's where you know, the, the largest land demands right now in the Midwest are occurring. This shows uh, what is, uh, where is the best sunshot, the highest sun intensity for solar. And you see Ohio, especially in Northeast Ohio, it's getting pretty light there. It's pretty low. And so, as I mentioned, Eastern Montana, where population density is less than one person per square mile, compared to rural Ohio, where it's about 100 people per square mile, uh, why is it going to Montana? You get 25% better sun intensity. Well, that's going to be the electric grid. And so here's basically the problem we face. Why, and probably why our investments have been misplaced in terms of, of going to net zero. It's I mean, literally the cart before the horse. And this shows uh, yellow is where it's primarily good solar. You see the sun belt. Uh, Texas is green because it has both solar and wind in the Great Plains, the Northern Great Plains, over here into the north, uh, upper parts of um, 
uh, Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, good for wind, or relatively good for wind. And so what one would hope was, well, on that classic day when it's cloudy, we want to move the move the electricity from the wind places here in the middle over to the cloudy places where they're not getting solar. Or on a day where the wind isn't blowing, we want to move the we want to move the electricity from the sunny places to where the wind isn't blowing. Well, we can't do that very well. Uh, and that is at the moment, that's because of our national grid. And so basically our national grid, though, uh, and I'll, I'll mention we have different subgroupings of it, but it's it's divided into three different groups, the Western United States, uh, the Eastern United States, and then here's Texas. And to show that um, here is basically where all the big transmission lines are. And I just want to know, boy, there's a lot more transmission lines over here than over here. But even more important, here's the Western grid and the Eastern grid where they meet. And here's where it meets with Texas. And right now we can, we can shift about 1,300 uh, megawatts a day between the East and the West. That's about 0.1% of our electricity generation. And so now we can't move across the country. And like Texas, if anything, is even more closed off from the national, from the nation than the East is from the West. So we can't move electricity around the way you'd want. And, and for that reason, that means, well, if I'm a developer and I have to build from the solar farm to the transmission line, I want to be near where a transmission line is, A, and I want to be near a transmission line where they're actually going to use the electricity. So yeah, I might even be near a transmission line if I'm out in Wyoming, but they're not, you know, because they can't ship the electricity east in a very efficient manner, uh, they're not gonna, it's gonna be, they're not gonna want to locate there for the most part. So this shows uh population density, darker, more people per square mile. Like I said out here, we got counties. I grew up right in that county right there in eastern Montana, probably the most report, remote place in, in the continental 48. And we got counties out here with, you know, uh, one third of a person per square mile. There's nobody there. There's no electricity use. Hence, there wasn't a lot of electric uh, capacity built over there. People are all over here. So I want to be, I'm gonna, even though the sun is not as bright, uh, not as efficient for solar production, I'm going to want to build it over here where all the people are. And so that's the story. Why Ohio? Why the Midwest? Okay. And so if I was to really get into this, they they split the grid into little individual uh, operating groups where to maximize the efficiency of, of uh, you know, turning on, you know, like having this one power plant turn on or off, depending on are you going to hit high peak you see, you're not. Uh, one other constraint uh, is that uh, solar projects now to get in, in line to be hooked up to the grid is now years out, you know, because there's so much uh, uh, being built. And as I'll talk about, even a fraction of what will be needed, a tiny fraction of what will be needed to get out to net zero, and uh, that we haven't really invested in the electric grid. Okay. So uh, what's driving it? I already mentioned the Inflation Reduction Act, 430 billion over the next decade or so, uh, about 40 billion annually, maybe a little, that's a little over 0.1% of GDP. Uh, I'm a little skeptical though, as I note here, about some of the things that were hopefully gonna come out of that, at least the planners. I already noted, we're going to get more energy efficiency by shifting from traditional transportation to electrified transportation, EVs, for example, or shifting manufacturing uh, away from coal-fired uh, boilers to heat, you know, say for steel to electricity, to shift to, so, and the electricity is renewable. Well, we've already hit some constraints. EV demand is, I, I shouldn't say is cratered, but it was going to, it was expected to skyrocket and it's now stagnating and demand for things like heat pumps are just a small fraction of what we were hoping, or at least they, you know, the planners were hoping when they, when the inflation reduction act was, was passed. And a lot of that is a lot of that one, the latter is due to 
frankly, the Biden administration has been very slow at rolling out uh, subsidies for pam for houses to buy e pumps. Uh, how much? How much more? Well, the White House said seven to eight times more solar and electricity by 2030. You know, you think of the scale of that. Now it's probably going to be more like triple, or you know, in reality. But we're talking about large increases of that. Uh, and so thinking about what's causing a lot of conflict today, uh, think about if we're, we're talking about on a scale of building four or five times more every year than what we're building this year, what kind of uh, divisiveness that could cause. Uh, by contrast, and I guess it just, just doesn't seem sexy to politicians, uh, the grid always gets which I said, well, our big problem is the grid. And we could get the grid fixed, then we could put the solar and the wind where we want it, and we could shift the electricity pretty easily to where it's needed. Well, in the Inflation Reduction Act, for example, it only received $3 billion. And we're talking about an economy that's nearing, that's going to average over this 10-year period, a little over $30 trillion in GDP. You know, that's that's nothing. Okay, so what was what's the hope of the Inflation Reduction Act and the, all these subsidies? Uh, the, the Department of Energy forecasts that if we had done nothing, we do nothing to just keep business as usual, uh, carbon, uh, CO2 emissions, carbon dioxide emissions would fall about 27% below 2005 levels by 2030. And that is because you know, just naturally energy efficiency is improving in the economy. Uh, the, you're like we use less manufacturing, you know. So switching to services, which is less energy uh, intensive, we our cars get more better mileage. We're just getting better. We're getting better, uh, more efficient using energy. So doing nothing is about 27 percent reduction. The Inflation Reduction Act will do about 35 to 41 percent below 2005 levels. In other words, a gain of about eight to 14 percentage points better than doing nothing. So, you know, so in itself, the Inflation Reduction Act, uh, what the Biden administration has done to actually fully reach net zero is, is, is just only a small step. You know, a lot would need to be done. A lot more would need to be done. And this just shows it from, uh, from the federal government, the Department of Energy investing in energy and it's link there. This is our CO2 emissions, carbon dioxide. You can see it falling since 2005, which is when 2005 is when they approximately peaked. And this is doing nothing. You see these blue lines. We keep falling due to increasing efficiency. And this is what the, the Inflation Reduction Act is uh, predicted to do by the Department of Energy. Okay. So given that background, that's going to be, that background I think is really important in understanding what's happening. Uh, this is our current energy use in the U.S. This is net generation of electricity, uh, thousands of megawatts. And so we go back 20 years. This is how much coal we're using uh, or how much coal. We got about 2,000, would that be a million, billion megawatts of electricity from coal. And now that's below a million. We've cut coal usage for electricity generation by more than half. Uh, and what has replaced it? Well, that's that's natural gas, uh, which we're much more efficient at producing. And that's gone from about uh, 500,000 to over 1.5 million. We now use, you know, we, we used one fourth as much natural gas as coal in 2000. We now use almost twice as much natural gas as coal today. And you see wind increasing and solar still way down here. Uh, right down there. So it's, uh, it's starting from a small base. This shows Ohio. Uh, it's not quite as dramatic, but you see coal falling, natural gas replacing it. Uh, you see this green line, that's uh, uh, nuclear. Um, and in basically, in any realistic scenario to reach net zero by 2050, whether, you know, whether this is something we want or not, but to reach net zero, if that's our priority, then we're going to have to keep ex most existing nuclear power online to reach it. And so uh, that, that's what you see here, at least in Ohio, we're a little bit above the national average in, 
in electricity, and I'm sorry, nuclear. Okay, so what does net zero look like? So this is the report I'm referring to. You can download it. Like I said, it's not the law, but, but it's been very influential in Washington. So they report on basically five scenarios, which I'm, I'm, what I'm going to get, well, I'll talk about more is the land use implications. This E plus is, wow, you're going to really switch the economy to electrification, fully electrified economy. EVs, factories are all going to be electric. Everything's going to be electric. E minus, we're going to be less aggressive in that. Uh, e minus B plus would be less aggressive uh, electrification uh, with B plus being a lot more in, in bio ways, particularly carbon sinks, carbon capture, so forth. And RE here, RE minus RE plus, that is renewables. So we use a, a lot of renewables, RE plus, not as many renewables, but offset that with the electrification. And they did, a, those are the scenarios that this report did. So just to show you a couple scenarios, this shows from 2020 to 2050, references doing nothing. This is how much natural gas the US will use to 2050. This is how much coal to 2050, diesel and other fossil fuels. That's what doing nothing will do. Here's those other scenarios. So like if we have high electrification, high nat renewables, this is what our natural gas usage will do look like. Drop rapidly falling to near zero. Uh, this is what coal would look like. It would be pretty much gone by 2035. Uh, diesel and gasoline and so on in terms of our uh, net emissions. Now, to be sure in this, it's not that we would go to zero in natural gas. For example, as this report notes, we still have needs for peaker plants where natural gas is still probably the most efficient way to do that in that that's that really hot day and everybody's running their air conditioning, or that's the day that it's uh, minus 20 outside uh, and, and everybody's running their heat. You know, we're still gonna need peaker, but it's gonna be you know really at the, only at those necessary times. Okay, so what's gonna happen to energy costs? This is what this study predicted. And so this is what uh, energy costs as a share of gross uh, domestic products. So this begins, 1970, about 8%. Here's uh, uh, my high school days, uh, the first energy crisis of the late 1970s, and it reached almost 14% of our GDP when energy prices sh uh, shocked. Uh, then uh, uh, this is what it looked like right as the uh, global financial crisis, Great Recession. And you might recall that oil prices, I think, peaked at 147 a barrel in 2008. And since then, they've been falling, and today, you know, right around 5% of our GDP's energy costs. And so if we do nothing, that would be around 3% of our costs will be energy. If we do these other scenarios, especially the high renewables, uh, that would go to about 6%, or just a little bit above what it is today. At least that's what they forecast. Uh, I, being an economist, of, of, we're kind of the most skeptical group. Uh, I, I, not that I have a scientific basis, but uh, I wonder if those are a little uh, optimistic or not. But their point being, well, the energy costs won't be something that would be um, uh, something to be particularly worried about. So, so this is basically how you get to net zero. Energy use, energy efficiency, and electrify the economy. Get away from diesel, oil, gas, uh, clean energy, wind and solar, clean fuels, bioenergy, in particular hydrogen is the one that's stressed, uh, even though today at the moment there's some technological problems, uh, carbon sequestration, carbon dioxide capture, uh, uh, reducing non-CO2 emissions like methane, which are much more dangerous in terms of uh, climate change, and then enhanced land sinks. So that's what the, the policy looks like. So this is, uh, for example, high electrification. What do we need to do? This shows, just say in terms of heat pumps, we would want to have 31 million heat pumps by 2030, 81 million by 2040, 119 million by 
2050, another 11 million just in California. And as I already noted, heat pump sales have been lagging way behind expectations. Uh, and that probably is related to the large subsidies in the Inflation Reduction Act. Biden administration has been quite slow at getting them finalized. And they say next year. Okay, so roughly uh, by 2030, 75% of our electricity, about double under scenarios to reach net zero by 2050, will be renewables, uh, hydroelectricity being, but mainly solar and wind. Uh, uh, nearly all coal-fired coal -fire power plants are going to be retired. Uh, natural gas is going to remain and start declining you know, in the 2030s. But like I said, we're still going to have to have some residual natural gas for those peakers under high energy electricity use days. And that's what this bottom one notes. We're, we still are going to have to have some. And if, to the extent that we do have natural gas or we still have trucks using diesel or what have you, how are we going to reach net zero? Well, we're going to have to sequester the carbon, capture it and pump it underground, which right now we could technically do it, but it's extremely expensive. And, and at the moment, it has to be heavily subsidized. So like in 2024, uh, according to the Department of Energy, 58% uh, of new capacity installed will be solar, 4% natural gas, 23% batteries. In other words, that's the store. That's that day where uh, it's really windy and you, you aren't using all the electricity near the wind turbines. You store it and use it when you need it. Uh, and wind, about 13%. Uh, at least that's what the Department of Energy predicts. And this is what is going to be needed in terms of building how much capacity. So this here, each of these, so ref again, that's do nothing. Just keep it on cruise control. This is 20 to 25, 2020 to 2025, 2025 to 2030, blah, 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 blah. Last one, 2045 to 2050. Yellow is how much new installation of solar if we do nothing. Uh, blue is wind. And then if it goes green, that's offshore wind. And going here, the, the scenario where we use a lot of energy here, or a lot of renewables, I should say, is way out here. And for comparison, before 2020, 240 was the most gigawatts that were installed in renewables in the entire world. China, which is the biggest installer of these. That's the best they'd ever done. And here's what the US, that was our best year ever. And so looking at these lines, we're looking at, wow, we're gonna have to be, not every year, we're gonna be way above what were record years for the US, way above record years for China. And even at the end, the late 2040s, we're gonna have to be you know, well above the best year for the entire world, just here in the US. And to split it up, we were doing 10 gigawatts of installed capacity and solar was our best year before 2020. As you get out 20, in the mid 2040s, we're gonna to have to be adding 177, almost 18 times more every year, adding 18 times more every year to that. To the, to that. Wind is gonna to have to be, on land wind will have to be about 10 times more. Then we have offshore wind, that's gonna be about triple what we were getting our best year before that. So if you in a rural area now where you still you see, you know, this opposition and divisiveness, what's going to happen? Imagine if you know going from scale where we're only doing 46 gigawatts of solar to 177. I mean, it'd be that the scale is 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 really going to be large. So a lot of background. Now I have to get well, what happens to the land? Well, one thing I won't talk a lot about is. Uh, we're going to be using, a, we're going to have to build a lot of transmission capacity and a lot of pipelines for CO2 sequestration. So this shows uh, basically how many, you know, more blue is uh, wind projects. You see the lines are large scale transmission lines. And you see, we're going to have to build a lot of those. And, you know, whether it's NIMBY or self initiate or what have you, people don't like transmission lines near their home. And so you can see if we're going to be building all of these new transmission lines, like I said, we'd have to build just uh, spur lines from the solar farm 
to the transmission to the to the grid, you know, just building all these is going to create issues. Uh, in terms of bio uh, biofuels, in particular, you know, creating hydrogen and using the hydrogen in place of natural gas or or coal, uh, we're going to have to basically transition a lot of land to this scenario. And I'll talk about how much in a second. Uh, so where's my land going to be growing? So going back to went from transmission lines, this is the scale. Green is our current large natural gas pipelines. I'm sorry, green is oil and orange is natural gas. So that, that's what our that's what our current system looks like. And like I said, people don't want to be near it, so forth. And so if you build more, uh, you're going to have issues. Okay. So what about the bioenergy? To reach, this isn't even the high bioenergy, to reach net zero by 2050 uh, in a high electrification scenario, this shows per every 100 by 100 square mile grid, this shows the large circles are 16 facilities of either bio HO2 or, or uh, uh, with carbon capture, uh, 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 I can't say that very well. Uh, that's to, uh, mostly for hydrogen. Uh, we're gonna look at all the plants we'll need. And all, then we're going to, to have those plants. We're gonna have to sequester carbon. We're gonna have to ship the carbon to the place making the hydrogen. And that's going to be on a scale that's going to be needed about 0.8 to two times the, so the scale of our current natural gas pipelines. So we're going to need a lot of pipelines. And that, you know, those, it's going to be high, you know, predominantly in rural areas. Uh, we're going to have to, because we're not going to be uh, all the way down to zero in carbon, in carbon production, you know, because we still have, you know, some residual natural gas, even optimistic scenarios. We're going to have to do some sequestration, carbon sinks, and we're talking about a scale of uh, by 2050 of about 1.3 to 2.4 times of our current oil uh, production on a volume equivalent basis. So there, a different set of pipelines that's going to be needed, and so this shows the scale, you know, all sort the scale of pipelines that would be needed to to for this carbon sequestration and or production of, of, of hydrogen, hopefully clean hydrogen. Then getting the carbon land sinks, uh, carbon land sinks are gonna have to play an important role. And there, uh, our expert on this is actually on it, uh, Brent Sanjin, but just to give you some feel, since he does, uh, uh, his area of research is these uh, carbon sinks, but just to give you a feel for the scale that we're talking about, uh, we're, we're, we're talking about uh, about 160 million hectares of carbon storage in agricultural lands. Land, uh, the, uh, basically uh, crops that, you know, energy crops that, uh, that we can either burn to produce hydrogen or they capture CO2 as they're growing. And this shows the scale of it across all agricultural lands and in particular, the plans are to shift ethanol production today to these energy grasses uh, that uh, I just described. And so that's the scale of that, about 11 million hectares of land would be affected there. In terms of reforestation, we want more forest, capture carbon, uh, about nine to 14 million hectares of that will be reforested, which, and this tells you about eight to 16 million of that's from croplands, one to 17 million of, the, of those hectares are from pasture, and that's about uh, almost four Ohio's, the size of Ohio. Uh, and then there's gonna, you know, then they talk about improved forest management in these scenarios. And this shows the percent of land in a state that's being affected, and in some states, it, in some states, it's uh, uh, the scale in Washington is is uh, is about seventy five percent of the land would be affected by these changing forestry 
uh, practices. Most of it for forestry practices, probably not a massive land use change, but a lot of it for reforesting where that could affect croplands and elsewhere. Uh, in terms of bioenergy scenarios, if we corn ethanol land converted to biomass crops, it's about 11 million hectares. As I said earlier, keep in mind that US cropland, pasture land is about 400 million hectares altogether. Uh, about 10 million to these perennial energy grasses, woody energy crops, about a million hectares, 12 million to other kinds of permanent covers to capture carbon. Pasture converted to biomass, uh, uh, about 15 million. That's, that's on the neighborhood. This is a high bioenergy scenario, but even on a moderate one, you get, uh, you get large numbers. You know, we're talking about 40 million hectares. It's about one tenth of the land right there. Uh, and so the total land affected is about the size of 30 Ohio's. Again, not all of it massive land use changes, but much of it, you know, for, you're asking farmers, you know, individual farmers, you know, them, well, you're asking me to totally change how I do my crop production. And in Ohio, just the bio part that I just, just the bio, not the solar, not the other stuff, just the bio, uh, they estimated about one sixth of our crop land in Ohio would be affected uh, by that. And as I've already said, Illinois, Iowa are well over one third. And as I said, disproportionately here in the Midwest, because I went through the grid where the people live, and also the Midwest is disproportionate where the best crop land is. Likewise, other kinds of conservation practices to get, you know, to fully get down to net zero, uh, no till. And cover crops in humid climates, about 50 per, in an aggressive adoption, about 100%, all the land would be affected by various kinds of no-till practices. In other words, real change here in the Midwest in farm practices. And uh, in dry climate, you know, but both in dry and humid climates, even under a moderate adoption, about half the land, and crop land converted to permanent uh, cover, energy grasses, so forth, even there, another five to 10% of the land, but we're taught. So again, farm practices are gonna be really changed. And because the entire world will be doing it, now remember, now we're talking about something that, that could be talking about shifts in uh, food supply if we don't get offsetting uh, producti productivity improvements. So this map, what I showed you earlier, 7.7 .7 million uh, hectare, uh, square kilometers of land in the lower 48, this is under the various scenarios, as I said, under a, even under a low renewable scenario, about a quarter million hectares will be converted to wind farms, and about uh, fourteen thousand, uh, sorry, two hundred forty thousand square kilometers, about ninety-five thousand square miles, uh, about fourteen thousand square kilometers, or about six thousand square miles for solar. That would be under the low scenario. This is the high scenario for renewables, where. So where I'm getting at is, is that that's a lot of land disproportionately in the Midwest, almost all in rural areas. And we're talking about, you know, for whatever reason, uh, it's not something that people want to be near. I don't think it's this is some sort of political story, although I you know, could, if you don't believe in climate change, you may be more resistant to it. But as I already said, it's a worldwide phenomena uh, in places that have, you say, you know, are much more accepting of uh, climate change scenarios. Uh, this this is a lot of land. And what's causing these problems today is just a slither of what's going to be causing of how much will be brought in every year, year after year after year uh, to 2050. And uh, I think one would question that even if this can financially be done, which I believe is possible, uh, even if this uh, engineering can be done, I don't know if it's politically feasible because I don't think uh, rural areas will will want it because they, they feel they're going to be bearing all the costs without some sort of compensation in return. And the kind of investment we're talking about in the rural areas uh, uh, is on the order of around 30 billion a year. And I've already said the US economy is 28 trillion. That's not a lot of investment, and especially 
capital intensive, this, you know, solar, once it's they're built, they don't employ very many people. Um, you know, rural areas, we say, hey, why, why are we getting all of this? And, uh, you know, we're not really getting much positive out of it. We're getting all the negative part of the cost of this. And that, as I said, will be a, if it's, if it's causing division and now, think of the political difficulties in the future. And though I'm not necessarily advocating at all for this, because I don't think I, if I was a politician, I think my life expectancy would be short. But I think the only way you could do that would be with some sort of federal land use policy, uh, which I think would even be more politically uh, unpopular. So uh, this just goes through for each state, what happens, uh, it's amount of time. So uh, takeaway is that to achieve net zero, which is basically what the climate scientists says we have to get to if we want to avoid uh, tragic costs from climate change, uh, we, we're going to have to get there. Uh, to reach it under current, what's the current policy, or at least roadmap for policy, is is going to is, is like I said I don't think it's technically impossible I think it's politically impossible because of these disproportionate costs being put into rural areas and so uh, if I was making recommendations especially in Washington my understanding is that uh, uh, I was at a Shell Oil visiting session in the fall in Houston. And uh, the speakers were saying, this is just not understood in Washington. That in Washington, they think that out there that this is popular because they think, that, you know, they, they think they're creating jobs while they don't quite realize, they don't realize the scale of the opposition. So uh, I will stop there and hopefully I didn't go too long for questions. No, that was great, Mark. Thanks a lot. A uh, ton of information and a lot of great questions on there. Folks can keep them coming in the uh, Q and A if you want. Um, I I just go through a few of them. Uh, start with Kathy's. I want to adjust it a little bit. Uh, it was basically there was a question about infrastructure, and you had talked about this and alluded to it early on. So this kind of goes back to the beginning of your presentation. Uh, but you know, one of the things she asked is, you know, are, you know, you pointed out there's going to be big infrastructure, there, there should be big infrastructure needs. And she's pointing out that there already are big infrastructure needs. And so the question is, is are urban areas paying their fair share for this sort of energy infrastructure that's happening in rural areas? And you can maybe broaden that, you know, are urban people paying for, when you're applying there's big costs out there, are, are urban folks sort of paying for that or who who is paying for it, I guess? Okay, great. Yeah, that's a great question. So in terms of, uh, uh, thanks for the question. In terms of the money, the financial money, that's going, going to be a little bit disproportionately higher paid for by urban areas because it's being paid out of general tax revenues or we're borrowing the money, eventually paid back by tax revenues. And that's disproportionately from urban areas because, because of uh, uh, they earn more money. So 85% of the population is urban and and the average income is higher in urban areas. What the what where I'm talking about though is what uh, what us economists also is those externalities, those costs that that aren't necessarily financial, but they're being they're they're being borne by somebody. And that would be like I live by a solar field and I don't like it for whatever reason. I don't like pollution. I don't you know I want a great pristine view. And I've already said that housing markets are starting to show that. You know how are you paying for it? Well, there's no market. But they're paying for it through lower housing prices. Uh, they're they're paying for it by uh, that a, a rural landscape that's that's potentially going to look very different than what it does today. Uh, and, and so it's the non financial costs that are being disproportionately borne by the rural areas. Yeah, that's super interesting. So a second question, which follows right perfectly from that, was from Matt Lindsay about uh, about those externalities that you mentioned on the hedonic values. Now, his point in question was, is aren't there existing externalities with coal-fired power plants? I Undoubtedly, there are, right? They're probably pretty negative as well. But your point is, I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that, you know, this is a lot more land, so it's going to affect a lot more people, these externalities. Is that basically right? That would be exactly, exactly, Brent, that we're potentially talking about a lot more people. That okay. uh, besides the climate change itself, which is a global externality that coal 
the local they're more localized they're gonna localize the footprint of coal production smaller yeah yeah okay that makes sense uh and you know so there would be a negative externality with any of any of these energy things but that just the footprint's bigger here so that that makes a lot of sense then um you know, here's another sort of footprint question and maybe another I didn't hear you talk a lot about that, but maybe you could sort of comment on it. Is that Lindsay uh, Torno asks about sort of biogas, biodiesel, biojet fuel, right? And you are you did talk about ethanol, right? I mean, there's other energy things that are being demanded of the rural landscape already, and some big requests for additional things, like if you think of renewable jet fuel being produced from bio, you know, from de or from soybeans, right? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, if you add that in, you know. What's it mean, right? If you add in a, yet another sort of big demand in the energy sector in the rural area, is it a good thing or bad thing? No, I, I think you answer well. You know, again, I should, you know, we should be as economists as you know, Brett, careful uh, in that that there's winners and losers. You know, those who don't want climate change would be a winner, and those, uh, but, but uh, uh, it's one more pressure on food that's going to be global that's going to potentially put uh, pressures on food supplies. Yeah, so if I'm thinking a little bit, uh, sorry, just getting a phone call there. If I'm thinking a little bit of my own sort of thoughts on that uh, and ask my own question, interject it here real quick, is that that's a really good point you're raising. I think, is it, I mean, the, the biggest impact, so rural landowners would undoubtedly benefit from this, right? Because their land values are going to be going up potentially dramatically, right? All this energy sort of demand for land kind of has, I mean, land is a fixed resource in a sense, and it's sort of the benefit of that's going to come back to the owner of that fixed resource. Uh, however, the big losers potentially also are the, the eaters, right? That's the, the same urban people who want this apparently clean energy if they want it, right? They also could be harmed by substantially higher food prices. And worse views and, and bigger externalities, right? Isn't that kind of it? That's true. Uh, though you're, you're right, your analysis is right that uh, landowners could be the primary beneficiary, uh, except that the value of the land probably for agriculture overall will probably be, will, uh, I mean, I know there's gonna be higher agriculture, but I should say the, the efficiency for agriculture will be less because you can be splitting up land a land that you could use to have con contiguous or adjacent lands for crop are now being split up into little pieces due to solar or land farm. So the productivity might fall uh, in agriculture, likely will fall for agriculture. But you're right, the, the beneficiaries will be concentrated, real slither of the population, and then everybody else are, it'll be will be pacing those externalities. Yeah. And so you know, Fred Ryder, and this is more maybe a political question, but I'm going to throw it out there anyway. It's going to be interested to your response. You know, do you feel that the numbers uh, that you showed I mean, eventually, he uses the word insanity, damper on this insanity. I'll just say, you know, is, might there be some sense in terms of thinking about how we can get to this nirvana future with clean energy, right? Given, you know, this sort of really difficult pathway you've sort of presented? I mean, you see anything different, a different pathway uh, forward uh, happening, emerging in the future? Well, that's that's I, I, under the current political thinking. The answer I I think I laid out would be probably no. I think it's politically impossible once these once this gets fully re, uh, captured in rural areas. Uh, but yeah, you can do it. We talk about a lot of the time as, as economists in our classes. You have to find ways of compensating the losers. Which is something that we don't think very much about, and right now I don't think we can compensate. I don't think it's going to be well received. Oh, we're you're getting all this investment. We, you know, there's going to be all sorts of jobs that are created. When in rural areas, you know, people have been hearing that for a couple decades now, and they're really skeptical of that. So they're going to have to find better ways of compensating. Uh, I'll call them losers of this transition. Yeah, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Well, we've kind of ended, uh, gotten to the end of our hour and got through most of the questions. Um, so I think we'll have to leave it at that, though, for this particular hour. Uh, appreciate everybody for attending today. If you want to hear Mark and see him in person, actually, we've got a uh, upcoming program in May. Uh, you'll be talking about a similar program. We'll be on a panel uh, where we'll be inviting uh, folks to sort of discuss this topic in more depth with other folks as well. 
uh, who know about the sort of question of sort of land use, probably a little more specific about Ohio. So that program is on May 8th. Uh, you can look on our website, uh, the AEDE website, to get information on that. And Mark will be uh, presenting in that. Uh, so thanks, Mark, for joining us. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Okay, so with that, we'll call it to a close and um, appreciate everyone for attending. And Miles, I guess you can come back on and uh, take care of any final details you would have.